Okay, so uh, my topic is preemptive concurrency in JavaScript. Uh, and uh, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, introduce to uh, the problem that we are having uh, with, uh, with concurrency and, uh, in JavaScript and, uh, and introduce two different mechanisms uh, or strategies for approaching uh, the solutions for uh, bringing preemptive concurrency. So, at first, let's look at a little bit of background. So, I'm a student at the Mathematical, Mathematical Information Technology Department at the University of Jyväskylä. And this is actually uh, part of my research uh, for my master's thesis there, uh, called Enhancing the Concurrency of Elm Programming Language. So, this covers also the uh, web worker approach as well. Um, but today, I'm going to uh, focus on um, on two different types of options for uh, solving the concurrency problem. And those are generators and trampolining. So the problem is that we have a limited amount of concurrency utilities. Uh, as John said, uh, we, have, we only have, uh, what we have is uh, web workers and also asynchronous HTTP requests. Uh, so would it be possible to actually build uh, concurrency ourselves in, like inside the browser, and not use something that's uh, found in, uh, in, in browsers like web workers. And would it be possible to actually uh, make it so that um, to, we can pause the uh, actual execution thread on every uh, instruction, or maybe not every instruction, but at least on, on, on a small uh, instructions. Okay, so first I'm gonna tell, uh, talk about generators, and then I'm gonna talk, uh, introduce trampoline. Okay, generators. What are what are they? Um, they're basically functions uh, that can be stopped um, in the middle of execution to yield some values, and when you call them again, uh, they uh, continue the execution from from the point where they last um, uh, stopped. So the, uh, the typical use case for uh, generators is to use uh, to make some kind of lazy sequences or uh, values that are generated. Not not um, you don't not um, create all the values at uh, at first, but uh, generate uh, value values uh, piece by piece. So you can make like uh, execution, um, like expensive execution, uh, only when you have to. And um, but this is this is all also useful for uh, uh, for concurrency because you can actually pause the execution. So imagine that if you have uh, multiple generators, uh, you can uh, run a piece by piece for each for each uh, generator, and and uh, then come back around and. Uh, call the next pieces for each generator. So basically, have uh, interleaved uh, your um, your generators. So in this case, what I mean by yielding is uh, you can you can think of yielding as uh, uh, as pausing the generator function. And of course, um, because the generator stops at the at the yield point. Uh, you can th think of it as uh, storing the remaining execution state. And these generators are actually introduced in, in the upcoming ECMAScript 6. So uh, these are available in some browsers. And I think uh, the latest Node.js has it as well. Uh, but they're not uh, mainstream yet, I don't think. So let's look at a simple example of um, of a generator function. So what we have here is uh, we tag it, tag it with, a, with an asterisk to make it a generator. Uh, here we have a function called powers of two. So basically you pass in a, in a number and uh, it will generate uh, powers of two up, up to that uh, number. So you have two to the zero, two to the first, two to the second, and so on and so forth until to the end. And uh, as you can see here, 
we have a field point here. So that's where the uh, function execution actually starts. It yields the value p. And uh, so here's an example of how to use uh, you. First, you make a generator or instantiate the generator by calling the function uh, with, uh, with some parameter. And uh, then you just keep calling the next function in that, uh, in that object. And, it's, and those are the, these are actually the results you get from calling uh, the generator function. So as you can see, it brings you values from uh, zero, 0 to the 60. And uh, each time it actually says to you whether it's actually done with the execution, whether the generator is uh, finished. And you finish the generator with the return statement here. So does anyone have any questions about how this works? Or is, there, is, it, uh, is it clear to everyone? OK. So if you're, if you're uh, familiar with Python, this is the same as Python generators. OK, so how about making it uh, preemptive? Well, in order to make it preemptive, you need to yield on every uh, function call to make a, every function call the uh, stopping point. So uh, you get a huge amount of uh, yields in the code. So basically, you get each, each uh, a line is a, a, a yield line. And not only that, but if you're going to interleave uh, uh, function calls inside, um, inside the generator, you need to have a generator, you need to make those functions uh, generators as well. And not only that, but you need to uh, actually capture those yields inside uh, the function you are going to yield. So you have, so you're, you're yielding yields from other generators. So you can't, you can't uh, yield inside uh, another function call. You, you ha always have to yield inside the generator, in, inside the generator scope. So those are the, uh, the, the kind of things you have to think about when you're making preemptive or list. Uh, the type of uh, concurrency where um, you have to stop in the middle of a function call inside the generator. Okay, so the anonymous, anonymous uh, function can't yield inside the generator. Yeah, a fu function inside a, a generator can't yeah, yield. Yeah, yeah. The anonymous function, a function inside yeah. the generator can't yield. Yeah, it can't yield. So it has to be in the same scope. Uh, one thing, but you can do anonymous uh, generator. Yes, you can do. Anonymous generator. Yeah. So trampolining. Um, there are basically uh, functions that, um, like generators, there are there are, there are functions that execute a small step and return the rest of the uh, calculation as something that can be called. And uh, and the final uh, final. Um, Thing that you return is the actual value. So you you have a deeply nested um, you have a you have a function that nests uh, anonymous functions to anonymous functions to anonymous functions, and the final final anonymous function actually returns the the the, the value. So yeah, like I said, they're basically like generators, but without the fancy syntax we had. Uh, but Unlike generators, we can actually do some other cool stuff. Like we can spawn, spawn uh, another execution thread. Simply, we return multiple functions from uh, from a uh, uh, from a trampoline function. So you can uh, take those functions and uh, put them to uh, some queue, and which keeps uh, executing all those uh, functions, and uh, you have a spawn. Uh, I can actually. Show an example. It might be not, might not be a, the most clear explanation. Okay, so here's a factor, uh, factorial implemented in uh, trampoline style. 
Um, as you can see, it's pretty uh, typical. Uh, it's recursive, so without trampolining, it should uh, explode in a uh, stack overflow. So you uh, give it an N, an accumulator, and uh, when the N reaches zero, you return the accu accumulator, and uh, otherwise you call the factorial again with, uh, with N minus one and accumulator times N. But what we are doing here differently is we are actually returning a, an anonymous function that calls the factorial. So when we have the factorial function here, we actually call it a number of times to get the result. And uh, if you want to uh, like um, spawn another execution thread, you return maybe like a list of functions, and then at some point here, you take all of those lists, uh, all of those list uh, functions in those in the list, and uh, then execute each one of them at any given time you want. So, w what we would like to do is actually um, change our old programs into this trampoline style. So here's an incomplete, in incomplete example of. Uh, how to be done. Uh, we have a, here a function called foo uh, that calls first, middle, and last. So we'd like to uh, first call the first function and then uh, uh, return a, a, a function for the rest of the execution and the rest of the, oops, rest of the execution calls middle and uh, its rest of the execution goes last. So here's foo underscore t, which does exactly that. It first co calls the first, stores it in a variable, then returns a function. And that function uh, calls middle with the argument first and stores in the variable. And the, finally, it returns a function that calls uh, last with the middle as the parameter. Okay. So that seems pretty really reasonable, but uh, what if we want to interleave last, middle, or first functions, like these function calls here? So here we have no way of um, actually, well, this is interleaved here, but these are not interleaved. So what if we want to stop the execution of first? Well, it turns out that uh, any program in tail form can be rewritten in trampoline style. And what I mean by tail form is a function uh, that has the, well, this is in tail form. This has no, nothing to execute anymore. This is the last execution that is here. So if we have a program this, that is uh, composed of these kinds of um, that's it, that, it, that is uh, composed like this, uh, we can um, make it trampoline. So to clarify, when you when you say foo t of forty two, and you apply the first parameter, yeah, that's going to do the first step of the first. Yeah. And then so on and so forth. So you're talking first, then middle. Yeah. How is this different from just laziness, let's say? Is it the same concept of laziness? Yeah, it's laziness, yes. But so why, why, the, why do you call it trampoline style? Well, the point is that uh, 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 about trampolining is that you return the uh, next execution. So you, don't, you can execute it, uh, the next piece whenever you want to execute it. And the another point is that uh, because you return it, you don't grow the stack. You can throw the uh, previous stack away and continue from running there, and so you don't get a like a stack overflow from uh, all those those calls in the, inside the calls. Okay. 
So the, in terms of another part is uh, this transformation is also called continuation passing style. Mm -hmm. um, and so to implement laziness, you would perhaps convert to continuation passing style. But the evaluation model would be, okay, only use computation if necessary. You can, yeah, with yeah, the same yeah. model, choose a different evaluation model that says, just run this until like I have done, I have spent like a second on this dilemma, whatever, I'm moving on to the next. Okay. So the point is, you can pause it and when you want to do that, depending on what your goal is. So, okay, anyway, as I was going to say, uh, for example, this here is tail, uh, tail form in the sense that the last uh, call here, the method is called the last, is, is in tail form. But uh, these are actually uh, not in tail form because they're inside the last. So what we'd like to do is actually convert it, convert the function so that everything becomes uh, tail form. And that's actually related to uh, con uh, continu um, continuation uh, passing style. The trick is to actually convert uh, your Elm uh, code into uh, CPS, which is continuation passing style, and then convert, convert that to trampoline style. So you're going to have a... Um, okay, so basically what uh, continuation passing style is for those who those of you who are not familiar, it's basically callbacks. So you call something and pass in something, some function to the function that, so that the um, function that you're calling should call that call function. Ah, yeah. <laughs> so how to explain? Well, you know, callbacks. <laughs> so you're going to have a callbacks inside callbacks inside callbacks. But, you know, uh, the problem with that is that it, it actually grows the stack. So if you're going to have something, something recursive like the factorial, you're going to explode your stack. Uh, but with trampolining, you, it, the stack will still uh, remain, remain the same. So as a result of this, we actually get uh, interleavable Elm functions. Uh, because it turns out that it is possible to convert Elm into CPS. Uh, and so, so if we can convert to CPS, we can con convert to the trampoline style, and hopefully we can build a uh, smart enough scheduler that can uh, uh, execute those functions uh, uh, so that they're interleaved. So you can, so you execute one step at a time for each function. And uh, the one cool result of this is there's no actual yielding or trampolining visible in, uh, in the Elm code. So you just maybe use the async um, um, keyword to uh, say that this must be converted into trampoline style. And that's it. No tra uh, trampolining inside your own Elm code. But this, is a, this actually brings uh, another question uh, about performance. Because it turns out that CPS uh, really makes your, your code a lot more um, bigger in size. And it has some really, um, some uh, function calls that are, you could say, um, unnecessary. That some function calls that you wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, and you have to really think about uh, the options on how you convert to CPS. There are some several, several um, um, algorithm, algorithms for uh, converting to CPS. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, building preemptive schedulers uh, actually brings us some cool stuff. Uh, basically, we get uh, more browser comp compatibility. So not only does it uh, work in uh, to modern browsers, but also in some browsers that don't support maybe like web workers or some other types of uh, features. Uh, and this is also, this uh, allows us to actually build concurrency in Node.js as well. Uh, and also, uh, these techniques aren't uh, something that's um, just for JavaScript. So 
these techniques can also be ported to other languages as well. So in, if we continue using these methods, uh, we can actually reuse them if we decide to uh, make uh, Elm build some other target language. Okay, that was my pre presentation. Uh, thank you. And I can actually show you uh, some, if I can expand this. This is Emacs. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this is small text, but I can uh, actually show you. You can go to a file uh, or edit options, blah, 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 blah. It won't even save your options. You just have to save the options. <laughs> so, well, well I, can, I can actually show you. Uh, here we have a function here. This is really small, but it, sa it says that it's a lambda that uh, has a lambda inside it, so it's uh, y to the x. And uh, that has a that actually calls uh, sums up the x and the y with four, and then we pass it uh, two values, uh, seven and seven and nine. So basically, this just calculates uh, three uh, different values in the in the sum, but it's expressed in in a in a very kind of awkward way. Uh, so, and that's actually the, below it, the, the sample is uh, the representation of the, of the calculation uh, as an expression. So if we uh, compile that expression into uh, CPS, we get this here. So as you can see, it's a lot more <laughs> complicated. So there's definitely going to be some, uh, some things that you have to think about. When you're compiling with the CPS. As you can see, here's x, here's the y function, uh, this is the y variable here, and there's just four number, this nine, seven, so it's really <laughs> awkward. It's very, very, very difficult, difficult to follow that kind of code. I, I have to actually follow that code in order to uh, figure out. How, how I'm gonna trampoline this, and it was hell. <laughs> <laughs> and so basically how you actually trampoline it, so it is the, uh, I have the code here, is, this here is the uh, Pascal function for converting an expression into a trampoline function. So if you encounter a lambda function, uh, uh, no, no, sorry. Uh, if you encounter an, an function application, you wrap it inside a lambda lambda function, and uh, maybe wrap it in the, some kind of uh, uh, data structure. That uh, so that you can uh, differentiate between uh, uh, something that can be continued and something that is already done. And uh, otherwise, you basically just to do the same same thing as in the in the same thing as what you have in the expression, and also one thing to note is that uh, only the tail form uh, functions are uh, something that you can convert into trampoline stuff, and uh, so basically in the in the final in the final function that you have that is converted from CPS to trampoline style. You have a, well in CPS you pass in some kind of function that is called when, uh, when the execution finishes. So in that case you pass in a function that actually wraps the, um, uh, the, wraps the, the result into some kind of data structures that tells you that you're finished and you return that value. I don't know if it made any sense, but we can look more examples later on if we have time. Yeah. So one thing I got from the listing, you said that it would be possible to have in your normal code to run uh, regularly. Yeah. And then code that it. Yeah. 
well, of course, of course, if you have uh, functions that uh, are run regularly, uh, like in a, in a normal way without tramp lining, of course, those are going to block the tramp line functions because they are, there's only one execution thread. But uh, if you have much, many of the functions uh, tramp aligned, you can interleave those that so, so that they don't actually block the executions of uh, uh, other functions. Yeah. And so you can choose depending on yeah. like, oh, this is taking forever to call the CPS version. Yeah. Uh, and do exactly. Version. Exactly. So in, in like simple cases where you don't have expensive calculation, uh, uh, you could do uh, non trampoline style, and it probably is more uh, uh, cost efficient actually to run it. Yeah. So one of the key things with the like carefully file, so, so a lot of Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah, those are definitely something, uh, some things to consider when you're actually uh, building this kind of concurrency. Uh, I actually read a blog, uh, which I have linked here in, in the presentation. Uh, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I, if I do it like this. There we go. Yeah, compiling it uh, to JavaScript in CPS. This actually talks talks about a little bit about the performance issues that you have with compiling to CPS. And the main problem is that you get so much uh, uh, to, uh, like uh, unnecessary code that's get that gets called and many functions. Deeply nested functions. Yeah, so another part that's unfortunate is uh, if you have continuation passing style. So some compilers will go through continuation passing style, do lots and lots of optimizations on that, and then map that directly onto uh, assembly code and use jumps to represent calling the next, mm. uh, the next continuation. And so effectively, you map onto something super fast because you're just jumping from one place. And in a language like C, go to, and yeah. you can just do that. So at some point, someone was like, what if JavaScript had go to? And at first I was like, why would you even say that? <laughs> and then I was like, wait a second. It actually makes that sense. That would be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> From the perspective of compiler writers. Yeah. That would actually probably make it, if it doesn't have like some really stupid implementation in the background, <laughs> uh, it actually, if it would be an actual go to, it would actually May make it much more, much more efficient. Yeah, hmm. so I, 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 I feel like there is a small, perhaps, possibility of this. Yeah. So like the, the mscripten project and like compiling C++ to browser, they, they'll start saying, hey, what if we had this thing? And so like, you'll start to see some of, or like, when it's in the interest of the browser, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're saying that the browser is already doing a lot of functions in So are there already patterns in today's new having startups that optimize the 
I haven't actually looked into it. And I'm guessing that it has some uh, ways of optimizing uh, continuation passing style. But I think this is just too uh, like extensive use of like the Mac, uh, this is like the when you build everything in continuation passing style, it doesn't really help. So like in, when people are human, CPSing or Yeah. That's, that's actually uh, something you have to think about as well as uh, what functions do you think of as uh, primitive functions and what functions do you think of as something that can be, that should be um, uh, uh, used with um, continuation passing style. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So like if you know something's going to be quick, just feel yeah. like, okay, this yeah. never. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you shouldn't like do the some, some Summing of numbers yeah. as continuation passing stuff. <laughs> Also something I, I want to point out is uh, uh, CPS can be used for a lot of, a lot of things. The, this is, the concurrency thing is not the only uh, application for it. Uh, another thing to use, which actually the, the second uh, article uses for is um, debugging. So you can like step your program one at a time and see what the variables are and so on and so forth. Yeah. That's funny. 